think that we have everyone or are we still waiting? We're good. All right, excellent. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, hopefully you're all in the right place. This is the Undergraduate Research Symposium, uh, specifically the session titled The Earth, Sky, and Everything in Between. Uh, so what we're going to see today and hear today is going to be uh, some undergraduate research. Uh, the, the students will be presenting their research posters on, uh, it seems like, various topics in the earth sciences. Um, so these will be about five to eight minute presentations. Uh, there will be time for questions at the end, and we ask that you refrain until the end to ask those questions. Um, if there's anything that comes to mind while these talks are ongoing, uh, please use the chat function to ask those questions, but do not use the chat function um, for chitter chat or anything else. We wanna restrict that uh, to only questions. And again, we will get to those at the end. Um, so something to keep in mind is, you know, these students have worked very hard on all of their research. Um, and this is uh, a new format for all of us. So uh, there'll definitely be some adjusting that, that I think will need to go on. Um, and we wanna stay really positive during these presentations, you know, make sure that your questions um, are productive. And of course, we welcome feedback, we welcome critique, um, but we want that to be constructive. Um, and so, yeah, let's make sure to have a nice, uh, you know, a nice clean fight. Uh, and here's some really interesting talks this evening. Um, I think that the guests have all been admitted. So welcome to all of you as well. And I think that we will get started. Uh, so it looks like our first talk this evening is from Justin Day, who is a biology major. So um, I guess go ahead and take it away. Great, thank you. Let me just share my screen really quick. All right. Can everyone see that? Great, um, thanks for the introduction. My name is Justin. Uh, today I'll be talking about the results of my research project titled Our Buscular Mycorrhizal Fungi Colonization Decreases Under High Precipitation and Compost Treatments in Semi-Arid Rainwoods. Our buscular mycorrhizal fungi are a form of fungi that um, form a symbiotic relationship with 80% of vascular plants by colonizing the root structures. And in this relationship, they increase nutrient uptake to the soil and to the plant while simultaneously receiving carbon from the plant. Because of this relationship, they're proposed to be important for management and agricultural systems. Um, and one agricultural system of interest are Californian semi-arid rangelands, where compost amendment has been proposed as a practice to increase plant productivity um, by increasing soil nutrients. And simultaneously, these systems are known and characterized as um, being highly variable when it comes to rainfall and having frequent drought. Despite this, there's little known about the compounded effects of compost treatments and high rainfall variability on the AMF plant relationship. So here, we measure the AMF plant relationship under fertilizer and compost amendments across a precipitation gradient in semi-arid rangelands. We expect that as increased nutrients and precipitation supplement the benefits that AMF provide to their plants, the plant hosts are going to reduce their investment into AMF by reducing carbon delivery. Specifically, the first hypothesis is that AMF colonization rates are gonna be highest under no amendment soils then they'll decrease under inorganic fertilizers and be the lowest under composted conditions. And these effects are gonna be exaggerated by increased precipitation. Second, plant root biomass will negatively correlate with AMF under soil amendments. For this uh, study, we used a full factorial design, which can be seen on the bottom left of the poster, um, consisting of three soil amendment treatments, which are compost, fertilizer, and no amendment, Within those plots, we used three precipitation treatments, drought, ambient, and high precipitation. And from these plots, we collected soil samples, and from the soil samples, we collected root samples. And these root samples were cleared using potassium, hyd uh, potassium hydroxide and uh, stained using an ink vinegar solution. And through this, we were able to visualize AMF root structures, or sorry, AMF structures within the root. Um, and we were able to use that visualization to quantify AMF colonization as a percentage of root length. And that can be seen behind me in the screen and also in the introduction. Um, moving on to the results, this first figure shows us AMF percent colonization across the different treatments. Here I faceted these bars in sets of three, um, having compost treatments on the left 
fertilizer in the center and no amendment on the far right. And within each of those, we have drought in red, ambient in yellow, and high precipitation in blue. We can see in this first figure that the far left blue column is the lowest. I've circled this in red. And this is telling us that high precipitation and compost treatments yield the lowest AMF colonization. Conversely, in the next figure, which is set up in the same way, but instead measures plant root biomass, we see that the same column is higher than the other treatments. In the third figure, we looked at the direct relationship between AMF colonization and plant root biomass under the three different soil treatments. And we found that under the compost treatment, there was a significant negative relationship between AMF root colonization and plant root biomass, which I've signified with the red arrow. Taken together, for the first hypothesis, the data did not fully support it, as soil amendments alone did not have a significant effect on AMF colonization. But the combined effect of compost um, and high precipitation does partially support this. The second hypothesis is also only partially supported by the negative relationship under composted conditions. But the lack of a relationship under fertilizer conditions um, doesn't support it. Taken together, I like to think of these results as contributing to the knowledge around AMF in a cost-benefit analysis, um, where we can think of the cost as, um, from the plant's perspective, the investment of carbon to AMF structures, where the benefit, um, just to name a few, are nutrient acquisition and drought resistance. Under low nutrient availability, we have a very high relative benefit of AMF colonization. But when we use compost or fertilizer, we have a much higher uh, relative cost. Thus, um, I'm hoping that these results are going to contribute to the understanding of the AMF plant relationship, especially within agricultural context. And that's all I've got. Thank you. All right, awesome, thank you. Uh, awesome, Justin, that was great, thank you. Uh, so our next speaker, uh, I believe we've got Josh, Josh Annual Tan, he's an environmental science major. Hi everyone, um, let me share my screen. So my name is Josh Hale Tan. I'm a senior in environmental science with a focus on life sciences, as well as a minor in biology. Um, I conducted my research in the lab of Dr. Nelson Ting and my um, mentor is Claire Goodfellow. Um, and so I, I did my research where I examined the effect of collection method on microbial community variation detected by shotgun metagenomics and elephant dung. Um, so why do we want to quantify microbial communities from the dung of wild animals? Um, in wild and endangered animals where invasive biological sampling is not possible, such as in elephants, analysis of gut microbial communities may be one of the few ways we can assess aspects of individual and population health. Um, collection of elephant dung is non-invasive and elephant dung is widely available and easy to collect in the wild from otherwise inaccessible individuals and populations. Uh, specifically, shotgun metagenomic sequencing of DNA from dung, where all the DNA in a dung sample is sequenced, represents an exciting new development in molecular analysis enabling high resolution characterization of gut microbiome variation. In spite of this, no studies have been done to standardize the collection methods of samples from wild animals for shock and metagenomics or to evaluate whether different co collection methods can lead to differences in the microbial communities which det are detected in a sample. So my research question was, do collection, does collection method have an effect on microbial communities detected by shock, shock and metagenomics? And I believed that micro, microbial um, community variation will differ among the um, sampling methods. So to test this, I analyzed samples from a Bornean pygmy elephant named Chendra from the Oregon Zoo. You can see a picture of her in the bottom left. 
Um, Bornean pygmy elephants are an endangered subspecies of Asian elephants. There are only about an estimated 1,500 left in the wild, and Chentra is actually the only one of her kind in captivity. Um, the primary threat to these animals is the loss of habitat due to expansion of agriculture and palm oil um, plantations, as well as logging activity in their habitat. Um, a total of tongue, uh, 10 fresh dung samples were collected from Chendra using five different commonly used collection methods with two samples for each method. I then conducted a shotgun metagenomic analysis on these uh, samples and developed a bioinformatic pipeline to analyze the microbial communities. And you can see that pipeline described in the middle of the graph. Um, Species richness and alpha diversity using Simpson's diversity index were calculated for all samples, um, which you can see in a table on the top right, and ANOVA tests were run on R. Um, so I successfully classified reads from all of the samples from 12.84% to 51.81% of reads classifying to the species level in each sample. Um, looking at the results in table two, you can see species richness and evenness, where the pinch in RNA later and swab in RNA later methods had the most richness in terms of classes that were detected, and the swab and vehicle fix methods had the least. And ANOVA tests show that there is no statistical difference between the mean, num mean number of classes detected by the different methods. Um, alpha diversity is shown in the same table. As you can see, the swab and buccal fix had a much lower value than as compared to the rest. Um, the ANOVA tests show that there was an extreme statistical difference between the species detected, and post hoc tests indicate that the swab and buccal fix methods uh, appear to be significantly overrepresenting um, certain bacterial classes. Um, and below that, you can see a visual representation of what the class, what classes were detected, um, pointed out by the two blue arrows. That with the hierarchical pie charts, from a, just a visual standpoint, there seems to be a significant difference in the distribution between the two methods. Um, in the future, I want to expand this pilot study to include more replicates per method and increase the sequencing depth for each sample. And I would also want to investigate plant DNA in the dung, potentially revealing information about the diet of an animal. And to do this, I would edit the pipeline so that I, uh, to that I developed to include plant DNA to see if there's any detected in these samples. Um, in conclusion, to readdress my question of whether collection method has an effect on microbial communities detected by shotgun, metagenomics, uh, species richness is not significantly different throughout the collection methods, but species evenness is. Uh, the class gamma proteobacteria is in greater abundance in the swab and vehicle fix method than in the other methods. Uh, yeah, and that's all I have for today. Thank you. Great work, Josh. Thank you, and uh, thank Shendra for me. All right, so uh, I will. <laughs> next up on the list, we've got Megan, uh, Megan Polak. Megan is an earth sciences major in paleontology. Hello, uh, let me just share my screen. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Megan Pollock, and I'm an undergraduate junior earth sciences paleontology track major at the University of Oregon. I have worked on this research with my graduate student research mentor, Kellen Tate Jones, in the earth sciences department. Our research investigates the impact of distinct feeding ecologies on morphological variation in pinniped dentition. Specifically, this research focuses on the comparative tooth spacing variability of post canine teeth in the phocids or seals, L. carcinophaga and E. barbatus. Most modern pinnipeds, the group which includes seals, sea lions, and walruses, adapt a similar feeding ecology, which involves a combination of suction and pierce feeding to consume large prey. However, L. carcinophaga is distinct from most other pinnipeds as an obligate filter feeder that specializes in the consumption of small krill. To effectively strain the krill from the water, 
the dentition of this species must ensure the passage of water through the cuspate or sieved post canine teeth while prohibiting the krill from escaping back into the water. Since L. carcinophaga relies on this feeding mode to survive in a predominantly aquatic environment, our research is based on the hypothesis that this unique feeding mode causes greater dental occlusion in this species than in non-filter feeding phocids. We perform this research to specifically test whether there is stabilizing selection for lower variability in the post canine teeth in L. carcinophaga than E. barbatus. E. barbatus. The post canine teeth were chosen for observation due to the unique high cuspation and precise occlusion of these teeth in L. carcinophaga. To test our hypothesis, we collected linear measurements in the program Phylonimbus using previously gathered photographs of 21 adult specimens of L. carcinophaga and 11 adult specimens of E. barbatus. We measured the spacing between the principal cusps of the five post canine teeth in both species on the left side of the upper dentition and of the five post canine teeth on the right side. Once the linear measurement data was collected, we downloaded the data from Phylonimbus, converted the measurements to metric units, and uploaded the data to R. To ensure that there was no correlation between basal skull length and tooth spacing in either species, we performed a correlation test on each data set of the two species of phocids in R. Once we confirmed that there was no statistical correlation between the two features in either data set, we performed an F test of equal variances on the combination of both data sets in R. We found that the variability in the post canine tooth spacing of L. carcinophaga is significantly less variable than that in E. barbatus. This result supports our hypothesis that there is stabilizing selection for lower variability in the post canine tooth spacing of L. carcinophaga from this phocid's unique filter feeding ecology compared to that in E. barbatus, which is a grab and gulp feeder. Our results show that disparate feeding ecologies can influence morphological variation in pinped dentition. Our future investigation involves collecting linear measurements of the post canine tooth spacing in H. leptonics, or leopard seal, skulls, adding these measurements to the data set and testing the variability in tooth spacing of H. leptonics to that of L. carcinophaga and E. barbatus. Additionally, we will measure the tooth gaps of these three species in person to accompany the linear measurement data collected in photographs. Thank you. Great, thank you, Megan. I, uh, I love all of these presentations with pictures of animals. It's like the, uh, you know, the best draw to each one of these talks. All right, so next up we've got Shyla Davison. She is an earth science major. Let me just share my screen. So hello, um, my name is Shyla Davison, and I will be talking to you about a new specimen of Monosolix depicus from the Maskell Formation of the Twin Buttes locality um, found in Crooked River Basin, Oregon. And so Monosolix depicus is an early beaver that roamed central Oregon during the Middle Miocene about 15 million years ago. Um, this specimen was found at, in the Maskell Formation of the Twin Buttes locality near Polina, Oregon. This specimen, this, spe this is a actually special location because it produces exceptionally well-preserved fossils in an area where fossils are usually exposed and weathered prior to burial. Um, I have diagnosed actually two specimens of Monosolix depicus, but we will be focusing on just one for this presentation, and it's a right jaw of an individual. Um, this specimen, these specimens are important because they are the most complete remains of Monosolix that have ever been found. And um, the only other specimens that have been identified were only individual teeth. Uh, this specimen was identified to the genus Monosolex uh, due to the facetids and styids on the P4, which is the largest tooth, as you can see in figure one. Just for reference, the facetids are the hole-like structures on the top of the tooth, and the styids are the indentations on the side of the tooth. Um, the genus Monosolex are noted for having no secondary facetids, and the facetids that are present are always straight and perpendicular to the axis of the jaw. Um, the labial side of the P4 is also characterized by a mesocyte striid. Um, <clears throat> the straight facetids and the presence of a parafacetid and a mesofacetid 
as well as a metafaucetid confirmed that this specimen was from the genus Monosolex. And to diagnose it to species, I noted that there were only two, two known species of Monosolex in the John Day fossil beds during this time period. And they were Monosolex topicus and Monosolex progressus. And Monosolex topicus is known for being much smaller and having no langual striates and more facetids on the, on the lower dentition and no parastriads. Para um, this specimen met all the defining requirements of Monosolex topicus, and so it was pretty easy to confirm the identity of this guy. <clears throat> um, so Monosolex topicus, for my research, I was able to gather that it was a semi-aquatic, small-bodied beaver, early beaver, and their skull structure and dentition suggest that they had digging and burrowing capabilities, as well as being semi-aquatic. Um, the dentition also suggests that Monosolex topicus was a herbivore who had the ability to eat on grasses and leaves and seeds. And um, the extensive wear and the reduction of crown height on, on the specimen suggests that the individual was not a juvenile, but it was actually an adult who wore its teeth down over time. Um, this specimen was one of many specimens found in the Twin Buttes locality. And I included some other specimens. Uh, there's a rhinocerid and a picture of an amphicyotid. And um, ongoing research on this site shows that uh, there was a lot of other um, mammals that lived in this area. And some other known taxa include rhinocerids, amphicyotids, merikippus, just to name a few. Um, continuing work on this site will contribute to our understanding of evolution of Oregon's terrestrial vertebrates during a time of warming in Oregon's history. So pretty, pretty cool stuff. That's, that's all I have. Great. Absolutely some very cool stuff. And uh, I like Franny's comment that our colleagues at OSU might be interested in the research. But you know, here at UO, maybe just the better you know your enemy, right? Including their dental records. Yeah. All right, so uh, uh, next up on the docket, we've got Michaela Fishback. Michaela is an environmental science major. Hello, um, I will also share my screen. Let's see. Oh. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes, it's good now. Okay. Um, my name is Michaela Fishback. Um, I will be presenting my research on the population dynamics and endemic serpentine grasslands uh, amid anthropogenic environmental change. Um, so my research was done um, definitely in part uh, through or with uh, to assist my uh, graduate student mentor, Lisa Hernandez. Um, this was her project and I kind of took on some of the efforts towards um, these specific species. So um, essentially, the overarching story here is that in California around the San Francisco Bay Area, there are these grasslands that are being um, pretty polluted by the surrounding traffic in this area. The uh, emissions from vehicles um, being pretty high around the San Francisco Bay Area has caused an excess amount of nitrogen to be deposited into the soil. Um, furthermore, projected climate change uh, in this area is showing that there will be rises in precipitation. So overall, these grasslands that are characterized by being very low in resources, um, specifically very low nitrogen and high heavy metals and dry, um, they're not very conducive areas to most plant species except for the natives. Um, but like I said, these changes that are coming about are uh, allowing invasive species to come in and take over um, with their more resource acquisitive traits. Um, and this is a conservation issue um, for several reasons, mostly because this area, even though it is only 1% of the entire state's landscape, it includes 10% of the endemic species in California. Um, so it's a very critical area. There's a lot of species that only grow in this area alone. Uh, I have illustrated here a uh, portrayal of the bay checker spot butterfly. This butterfly is found nowhere else except for these grasslands. And its primary host plant is Plantago erecta on the left, which is a native form. 
Um, the plant on the right is Brom Bromus hardaceus, and that is an invasive grass that has come in. Um, so uh, that is more resource acquisitive, likes uh, more resources such as nitrogen and water, um, with those being more available, it's able to come in and take over. Um, so because this is a very uh, variable sort of process, this isn't like they all get converted and then they're gone forever, although that could happen eventually, um, they definitely go back and forth. And so field research is particularly difficult. Um, so for that reason, um, let's see here. There's the whole poster. Um, so I conducted a greenhouse experiment um, with Eliza Hernandez, as I mentioned before, this experiment um, included 72 total pots um, feed, uh, with uh, Plantago erecta and Bromus hardaceus at varying levels of competition with one another, at varying levels of water and nitrogen treatments. So in this figure here, um, this was the main figure that I produced with this research, um, we can see this dashed line represents the uh, seed production in Plantago erecta with no competition from this invasive species. So anywhere that it goes above this, uh, this uh, log ratio response kind of calculated uh, seed production um, data representation um, above the line represents areas where Plantago produced more seeds than it did when there was no competition. And under the line represents times where Plantago produced seeds less than it did when there was no competition. So this figure essentially shows us what it looks like, how Plantago responded um, when there was low competition, when there was high competition, and at low, intermediate, high levels of nitrogen, um, and with low and high amounts of water. I think I started to say this earlier, but this is especially interesting to see in a greenhouse experiment where we're able to replicate these conditions in a lab setting. Um, because this hasn't really been done before, where we get to see explicitly how um, the population sizes uh, are varied based on the resource uh, amounts. So we found overall that uh, with greater amount of nitrogen, Bromus was more successful and uh, Plantago produced fewer seeds. Um, and that water was actually, um, less water actually led to more Plantago seeds when there was low nitrogen, but at intermediate and high nitrogen, water uh, actually increased the amount of seeds as well. So um, less water is better when there's low nitrogen. More water is better for the native species when there's more nitrogen. Um, overall though, I think the, the key finding that we had from these kind of preliminary results were still putting some more data together on this project. But um, overall, I think it was really interesting to see that when there was low nitrogen and when there was low water in these two bars specifically, we see that Plantago actually produces more seeds in competition. Um, but when there are greater resources in this area, um, such as happens when um, pollution is higher, um, it has a less, but it has a less chance of success in competition with this invasive species. So that tells us that monitoring specifically nitrogen levels um, which is something we have a little bit more control over than how much it rains, um, is very critical for the protection of these native species. So, yeah. Excellent, thank you, Michaela. Uh, if your next project is on how to create more rain, I think you'll really uh, you know, go far with that one. <laughs> All right, so our, uh, uh, sorry, not our final speaker. We have a bonus talk after this one, uh, but our next speaker is Eleanor Frelick. She is an earth sciences major. So go ahead and take it away, Eleanor. Hello, give me one second to share my screen. If it will let me. Uh, there we go. All right. Uh, hi, my name is Eleanor Froelich, and I did my project on the evolution of camelids in the Pacific Northwest and how they respond to the grassland expansion. And camelids are individuals of the uh, family camelidae, which include modern camels, alpacas, llamas, and their non-domesticated comrades. Uh, so I did most 
of this using uh, data I collected from um, uh, a couple of different um, online, uh, oh, words are hard, uh, online uh, databases. And I got to this project because uh, I'm working with, uh, my, my graduate mentor is Dana Ruder, who is somewhere watching this. I saw her name pop up. Um, but she's working on uh, food webs, uh, paleo food webs, and so I have been helping her and kind of stole some of her camel data, or potentially. Um, so I took a look at camelids through time in the Pacific Northwest, specifically Oregon, Washington, and Idaho. Um, and I downloaded a bunch of data on uh, different occurrence sites and that's what that map is is uh, the localities of different sites organized by uh, Nalma age or North American land mammal age um, and uh, I wanted to see how camels respond to the grassland expansion or when we go from a closed environment to um, a more open uh, grassland environment and uh, I looked at this through uh, body size and some diet information. And so uh, when I uh, analyzed the body size, uh, body sizes, which I estimated through using an equation from a, a paper in a book published by, uh, written by Damoth, um, I found that body size changes over time with the yellow graph, with the lightest yellow being the smallest body size, the orangey color being the medium body size, and that, I don't know what to call that, uh, dark orange color uh, being a, um, the larger body size of above 500 kilograms. Um, and I also, uh, and, and this is, particularly interesting because we see the small body size die out in the Barstovian um, uh, while the larger body sizes stay on for much longer. Um, and then I also looked at Hypsodonti using data taken from um, uh, a paper, and I can't remember the last name of the author, um, but there's a whole bunch of uh, data that um, I borrowed about hypsodonty or how tall teeth are. And you generally see shorter teeth or more brachiodont teeth in grazers like deer in the modern day. And uh, you tend to see taller teeth, more hypsodont teeth in uh, grazers like horses. And so using measures of hypsodonty, you can kind of infer what your beasties are eating if they're herbivores and I think omnivores. But I found out when comparing just the Pacific Northwest camels to the North American camels that there are vastly different patterns. For one thing, camels show up in the Ch Chadran, uh, and you don't get camels in the Pacific Northwest, at least that I had access to or being, oh, did it go dark for everybody? That was weird. Sorry about that. Uh, we're able to see it now. Um, okay, cool. Um, but so, uh, oh, where was my thought? Um, we don't see Pacific, uh, camels in the Pacific Northwest until the Arikarean, which is about 30.8 million years ago. Uh, also, the smallest size of teeth, the brachiodont teeth, uh, in the Pacific Northwest die out in the uh, Barstovian. Um, right where the small size of camels appear to die off. While in North America, you only see the smallest size, the brachiodont teeth disappearing between the Barstovian and, nope. Is that the, nope, that's the, yeah, that's the Barstovian and the Clarendonian. Um, I also found that there is a large sampling gap between the Barstovian and the Clarendonian in the Pacific Northwest. Um, that's an issue. And that's just because there are very few sites in the Pacific Northwest. Um, but so, um, it kind of in conclusion, 
camel size, uh, camel body size and hypsodonty patterns are very different between the Pacific Northwest and the rest of North America. And future study would uh, entail um, actually looking at specimens and not just taking published data from publicly available databases and running interesting numbers uh, calculations on it. And it would also include looking at postcranial data for better body size estimates and other things, because one of the taxa um, is a giraffe necked guy, while other ones have shorter necks. And so that's a difference in what they're eating that you can tell quite easily. Um, yeah, that's what I have. Great, thank you, Eleanor. Uh, I think at least it makes sense to me that camel data is hard to come by in Oregon, so I think that's some really nice work you did. All right, so our final speaker, again, we have a uh, bonus talk in the session, uh, is Leila Biberek. Uh, Leila is a biochemistry major, so go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Um, okay. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Leila. I'm a sophomore undergraduate researcher in the Pro Labs. Thank you for letting me join you. Um, today, I will be presenting on the detergent dependence of cytolysin A oligomers, which we determined using native mass spectrometry. So membrane proteins are incredibly important in human health, and for those reasons, they are important to study. And one class of membrane proteins are the pore forming toxins, which are produced as water soluble monomers, but transition into transmembrane oligomeric pore complexes in membrane like environments. And um, PFTs are of particular interest in bio nanotechnological applications, um, which include uh, like nanopore sensors and drug delivery and drug delivery aids. Um, and, Crucial to these applications is the size of the pore, which is determined uh, by the oligomeric state of the protein complex. And if you're wondering, the oligomeric state is the number of subunits in a complex. So if something like right over here um, is a tetramer, that means that there are four subunits in this specific complex. And so we are interested in how the oligomeric state of an alpha pore forming toxin might vary in different detergent environments, um, as this information could be useful for engineering a desired pore size and nanotechnological applications by changing the specific environment. So the alpha pore forming toxin we studied was cytolysin A or Cli A, which is found in pathogenic strains of E. coli. Uh, this is the monomer of Cli A right over here. And so the crystal structure has been solved for the pore of Cli A, and it was dodecameric. However, other previous experiments using different detergents and lipids have proposed that Cli A form different oligomeric states like hexamers and octamers. Um, and so this debate makes Cli A an interesting pore forming toxin to study. So to begin our investigation, what we did was we purified Cli A and then incubated it in different detergents. And these detergent samples were screened using two types of polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. So we used um, Blue Native Page and SDS Page. And in Blue Native Page, we looked for high molecular weight bands, which would indicate potential ligamers. And in SDS Page, what we did was we um, used that to identify aggregates. And so we used the results from the two gels and identified uh, DDM, C12V8, and Triton X100 as possible detergent candidates for getting Cli A oligomers. Um, so these were further investigated using native mass spectrometry. And so with this technique, samples are transferred gently and directly from solution into the gas phase. Um, and so native mass spec can preserve non-covalent interactions, allowing us to study intact protein complexes. And this technique has two big advantages over other structural te techniques for this particular project. The first one is that because samples are transferred directly from solution, we can easily change our solution conditions, such as which detergent we use. And the second um, big advantage is that native mass spec is especially advantageous in determining the oligomeric states because we can measure both the mass of the monomer and the intact oligomeric complex. So if we go back to this example over here, if we know that the mass 
of the monomer is one unit and we have that the mass over here is four units, we can deduce that this is indeed a tetramer. So our results indicated that the oligomeric state of Chi A is in fact dependent on specific detergents and that multiple different oligomeric states can be obtained. So Chi A formed up to decamers in DDM, um, Chi A forms up to dodecamers in C12E8, uh, formed many oligomers in Trinex 100, um, and so with the detergent OG, it caused Chi A to aggregate and crash out of solution while uh, the detergent FOS14 heavily adducted to only monomers. So what we're doing is we are investigating what properties of these detergents influence the specific oligomeric state by using molecular dynamic simulations. Um, so we're forming model structures of varying Chi A oligomeric states and are inserting them into different detergent micelles using MD simulations. Um, and so these results will help us predict the stability of uh, different complexes. So in general, our results show that the oligomeric states of Chi A core complexes do vary in different detergents. Um, and these results will be further investigated using MD simulations and will be repeated with another alpha pore forming toxin, Fragacea toxin C or FRAC. Um, shown right here. Uh, and these findings will not only advance the fields of mass spectrometry and structural biology, but they'll also provide insight for the pore forming toxin applications in bio nanotechnology. So with that, I'd like to specifically thank my graduate mentor, Amber, for helping me and teaching me this past year. And I'd like to thank my PI, Dr. Jim Prell, and the entire Prell Lab. And thank you guys for letting me present. All right, awesome work. A little bit uh, more up my alley. I understood a few of those words, at least. All right, so uh, that was our final speaker. Um, so we have about uh, 15 to 20 more minutes left in the session uh, that are that's open for questions. So yeah, I, I agree with uh, the comments here. Everyone did a wonderful job. Uh, excellent, you know, very few technical difficulties. Uh, and seeing that we're all still trying to get used to, you know, what's uh, kind of been cliched as the new normal. I, I think it, it went very well. All right, so um, I'm not seeing any questions here in the comments, though, Franny, you can correct me if I missed any. Yeah, let's provide a minute or two for people to type. I know dead air can always sure. be a little uh, <laughs> uncomfortable, but typing does take a minute. Yeah, so, so yeah, feel free to type a question. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, feel free to type a question or I believe there's like a raise hand feature um, so that if you want to ask your question out loud, uh, you can you can do that. I believe we can unmute you. Uh, but uh, so our first question is from Kellum in the comments. Kellum asks if uh, if Tan, uh, so I believe this is Josh Tan, collected the, the elephant poop himself. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I did not. Um, my mentor, Claire, good fellow, actually did all the collection of the poo. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I wish I could say I was there for it, but I wasn't. <laughs> yep, maybe next time. <laughs> I'm sure you guys have some very good, uh, you know, under the, t uh, you know, good phrases to say when the research isn't working well, right? You know, it's like working with elephant poop or something. All right, uh, and okay, we have another question. We have, let's see, another question for you, Josh. Uh, if you have any ideas why the evenness would be affected by collection method. Um, sorry, so there's two questions. Um, yes. Okay, so I'll, I'll, just, I'll address the alpha diversity question first. Um, so alpha, the, Alpha diversity was really low because the amount of um, DNA reads that were assigned to a, the gamma proteobacteria class were significantly higher to like an order of probably 10 to 100 times more than all the other sample methods. Um, so that really drove the evenness down because they were so present in um, 
in that in that one method. Is it, it might be easier if I share my screen so I could point to. Um, sorry, give me a second. So, um, for example, the swab buccal fix, uh, you can see in the hierarchical pie charts, the one on the right, that section that the uh, arrow is pointing to is that pro gamma proteobacteria class, whereas it's this, um, on the left, it's the same class, but you can see it's a much, much smaller section of the overall graph. And so because that one class was so prevalent in that, uh, this one method, it just, it, it made the evenness really small because it was just, um, there's a lot of it in that sample. And as for why, um, sorry, let me bring up the chat so I can see the question. Um, we're not quite sure why the evenness is affected at this point. Um, we're still doing some research into that. Yeah, we're, we don't really know why that one class is so uh, overrepresented by yeah, that one method. Great, thank you, Josh. So it looks like our next question is for Eleanor. So we're back to talking about camelids. Uh, Eleanor, does the trend in body size and tooth height in camels match the trends in other ungulates? Ungulates. Uh, ungulates. I'm sorry. Ungulates. Ungulates. Um, I'm not as well versed in the literature as I should be, um, uh, but from what I understand, at least in broader North America, I'm definitely not sure about in the Pacific Northwest. Um, as we get grassland expansion, horses, uh, horse tooth size does increase, and that's generally where we get most of our information about how um, the grassland expansion occurred when and how and where, but you can't know everything from just one beastie. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure the specifics, but I'm pretty sure yes. Yeah, it looks like a good area for future research. I, uh, I presume it's easier to find horses in Oregon than it is to find camels. <laughs> All right, so let's see, that's, that's all of the questions we've got in the comments, unless anyone's uh, typing away right now. Okay, so this is, uh, yeah, it looks like this is a question for Justin, I believe. Uh, so let's see, Michael Richter asks, what are the potential commercial benefits of learning how symbiotic fungi react to soil amendment and water? Um, as far as commercial benefits, um, the, the whole context of the study is, um, it was funded by, um, the USDA, the Department of Agriculture. So really, um, the overarching purpose of the study was to understand the effect of compost and high rainfall variability on plant productivity and on plant diversity and on, uh, uh, management of ecosystem services. Um, so really, uh, I think from, from a commercial or an agricultural standpoint, um, many agricultural, uh, well, farmers and ranchers would probably consider that as weighing more, like the, the plant benefit over um, the fungi. But I think maybe from one future direction we were thinking about was from a, like a conservation perspective, um, if having decreases in fungi or just like uh, ineffective management of fungi could affect plant biodiversity um, or plant evenness. So I guess that's one uh, benefit of learning about it. Um, not necessarily from a commercial perspective though. It's a good question. Yeah, I've always thought that was 
I've always thought that was fascinating how uh, interconnected, especially the, you know, the fungal universe is with kind of, you know, what we, what we see as being nature, the trees and the, the plants and everything, and how the two are just, you know, really inseparable and complex. So yeah, that is, that's a really interesting question. Uh, so it looks like we have a question for Megan, but we, we've got one more for Justin. So if we're on the topic, uh, let's continue. So, so Michael Richter uh, follows up, can the fungi be grown commercially and then used as a fertilizer? Interesting. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I've not done a whole lot of research into the literature around that. Um, I was more concerned about the direct relationship itself, but I do know that you can get um, like additional like topsoil that has fungi in it um, or has AMF in it um, to add to your crops and that's been used in studying the benefits of AMF on um, well on nutrient acquisition and on drought resistance specifically. All right and then we've got a, a question about the statistical program R uh, do you have any kind words to say? I know it's not anyone's favorite. <laughs> Perhaps if anyone's used R, right? I personally have not, but I know it's got a bad reputation among my fellow grad students. I think I, I can say that it was somewhat of a, a love-hate relationship. Yeah, those uh, powerful mathematics, I feel the same way. A lot of good information there, if only you can dig through all the numbers and Greek symbols. All right, so we've got a question from Dana Reuter. This one is for Megan. Um, so she asks, would tooth length variation also be different or just spacing, potentially both? Uh, also, do these animals always have a consistent number of teeth? And mentioning the, the fact that walruses do not always just a new one on me. <laughs> That's actually very interesting to think about because when I was analyzing the skulls for the phylonimbus linear measurements, I actually noticed that some of the teeth in the crabidary seals were much longer than the bearded seal teeth, which also makes sense because the crabidary seals rely on dental occlusion. And so they would want their upper and lower teeth rows, um, essentially no space between those while they're filter feeding. So the krill can't escape. So I think it would actually be a pretty interesting thing to do some other research about. And also I've noticed that the bearded seals had teeth growing everywhere. It definitely was not consistent at all. And that was one of the problems that we had when we were uh, measuring the teeth. We kind of had to pick and choose. Uh, there were like two teeth growing side by side in several places and it was really weird. <laughs> and uh, also bearded seals uh, are suction speeding suction feeding specialists like walruses as well. So that's interesting how they both kind of have that feature to them. Thank you, Megan. It looks like we have a follow-up comment from Dana saying that you could also look at the integration patterns between upper and lower teeth. I think that would be really interesting to do actually. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, next up we've got, uh, it looks like two questions for, uh, sorry, for Shyla group project. Uh, Shiloh, does the occurrence of monosolex tell us anything about the paleo environment of Twin Buttes? Um, and then uh, it looks like a second question asking if the beavers munched on trees and how to tell whether they did or did not. Yeah, those are really good questions. And actually, um, the occurrence of monosolex does tell us a little bit about the paleo environment. That's kind of what I am ongoing research right now, researching of like what kind of environment was in. Um, like I told you, it was kind of a different beaver because it burrowed and um, dug like not normal beavers do. And it was also a lot smaller. So, it, and it was, they lived during a place, a time during the mid um, Miocene climactic optimum. So it was like warming. So definitely a period of change. And so that's uh, some ongoing research that I'm looking at. And um, I, based on the teeth, um, I don't think they munched on trees. I don't think they did. I, um, I'm not really sure. <laughs> well, 
Well, maybe some combination of uh, your project and Megan's, right? Looking at the different teeth. I don't know. I'm sure you could make something of that, but my non-biology brain cannot. <laughs> yeah, Dana agrees. Perfect. All right, so we've got a few more minutes here. Uh, if we have any more questions, feel free to ask. Um, otherwise, I think we can start wrapping up. So let's wait maybe a minute or so here, see if anyone's finishing up writing their question. All right, it looks like we're all quiet. So um, I would just like to thank you all again, both the participants for giving some really awesome talks this evening, and then also our, um, our audience for, uh, first of all, asking some really great questions and also uh, being very attentive and you know, giving us someone to talk to. That's, that's awesome. Uh, so with that, I think we'll wrap up. Uh, I don't know, Franny, do you have any final words? Thank you all so much and have a lovely evening. Congratulations, you made it. <laughs> yes, and I agree with Dana's comment here. You should all be proud. This was some, some excellent work. And, you know, we all know research is never easy. Uh, and so the fact that you can create an entire poster, present on it, is really a feat. So, uh, you know, congratulations to all of you. Excellent job. And, uh, you know, stay safe and have a good evening. Yes, Thanks and uh, these will be recorded and uh, up on YouTube within the next couple days. So. Fabulous. So long, everybody. <laughs>